starting recording. So this is our August 21st meeting, OSC developer team. This is the, the week before game day. Game day is the 25th, that's Saturday. We're starting the immersion program boot camp. So that's a lot of um, activity that's gonna be going on here. And preparing, doing mostly inventory right now. We're pouring the floor in Hab Lab. Uh, for the immersion program as we currently speak right now and uh, looking at <laughs> let me share my screen and <clears throat> at the same time these cantaloupes are autonomously growing in our aquaponic greenhouse so I'm on my way back <laughs> I'm way outside I'm, I'm here okay um, and when they get ripe, they drop off to the floor and I eat them. We're working on an OSC marketing here. We are uh, working on the logo for the 3D printer and the micro factory and all the machines. So it's a modular design. Um, what else? <clears throat> what else can I report on? I'm just getting ready for the, for the immersion. I wanted to find, uh, let's see. So this is photogrammetry here. I wanted to find a picture. Now you've seen the hydronics picture that's getting buried by concrete right now and we're going to have heat so we're preparing for year-round operation looks like with immersion and our growth we're going to be probably building starting to build again on site at open source ecology here in terms of additional facilities to make uh, a world-class research and development center for open product development so let's see i oh, got plenty of people joined up okay so why don't we go right ahead with um actually um yeah, let's actually roll today. I, part of the deal is that uh, we're getting a van back up and going and I actually got an appointment to get the van inspected today. So I got to cut out like quarter to quarter to three. So just a little short today. Uh, but, but that's my, um, my, my agenda up here is I've been doing uh, some documentation work. This is, John is doing work on a extruder of the 3d printer this is something i did as a little visual bill of materials for the extruder itself i think the extruder itself is perhaps one of the most complicated parts of the 3d printer compared to anything else i mean the rest of it is pretty simple the extruder itself i would say it's much more complicated and it's something we're borrowing from the prusa i3 mk2 it's a modified version we modified it slightly for a larger uh, distance sensor so we can stay further away from the, the heat heated bed so we don't crash into it as easily. So that's a design geared for scalability in terms of larger print surfaces. Like say we want to do a one meter area 3D printer, we can do that. We're, we have less risk of hitting the bed with the, with the extruder or with the sensor itself. All right, so let's continue. Let's, um, let's have some updates. Maybe Sarah, since you were excitedly talking about updates on the photogrammetry, Maybe you can uh, continue next, see what we've got uh, for your progress on 3D scanning with a digital camera. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, the idea is take some pictures of an object and um, get it into a form that could be 3D printed. So, um, Harman had uh, kind of defined or found out a, a process using open source software to do that. Um, the first step being to use Colmap. Um, we've run into a lot of hardware issues using Colmap to the full extent. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was able to do to build on Harman's work is um, using Colmap, I generated what's called a sparse point cloud. And then using another tool called OpenMBS, I made a dense point cloud. And once you have that, you can take it into Mesh Lab to actually generate a mesh that can be converted into something that um, this is what I'm looking at right now. But the idea is it'll give us the final product that we're looking for that could be used to, to 3D print the object back out. Uh, does Colmap have, you're saying we're giving up on Colmap because it's got hardware issues? Like uh, it's not, doesn't work great with uh, process processors or? Well, what I found is um, without any special hardware, you can use it for the first step of the process. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, right now, for me, as someone who doesn't have the specialized hardware, it's a three-step 
process. It's pretty involved. So uh -huh. um, there are ways to simplify it, but from what we know right now, um, it's, it's pretty hardware dependent. So you, are you saying that with Comap, it sucks up so much power that you need a GPU to run it? Yeah, the feature that generates the dense point cloud, which is like the second step in the process, right? You go sparse point, dense point mesh. Mm -hmm. And I cannot generate a dense point with Colmap because it requires a um, CUDA-enabled GPU. Um, so these are only the NVIDIA brand. But Harman had also reported that he tried that um, and still wasn't able to get it to work. So the claim is different from our experience. Hmm. Okay. Do you have any um, any images that you can share or anything? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, you can share your maybe send a link or share share your screen. Yeah, I have it pulled up in MeshLab right now. Yeah, you could share your screen, MeshLab. Um, I don't think we have MeshLab yet in OSC Linux. We're working on an next OSC Linux release to, so we can have all the new software like for CNC circuit milling and as well as the programmetry right within OSC Linux. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So Harman um, actually put together photos, a photo set of the cordless drill, but I went ahead and used a test data set so that uh -huh. I could be sure the images were actually working properly. Uh -huh. And so this is some castle. Mm -hmm. And um, what you're seeing here is the dense point cloud in MeshLab. Yeah. So my next steps are um, going through some tutorials to figure out how to refine this and um, complete the, the texturing of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that MeshLab can do all of that. So I think I'm in a, in a good spot again to make progress. And the, you didn't try this with the drill, cordless drill data? I have not yet, but okay. once I know what I'm doing with, with this, I'll, I'll look at that too. Okay. That sounds good. Great. Um, so what, what are your main learnings in this adventure so far? Um, yeah, main learnings. I was really amazed by all the, the difficulties with hardware. Mm -hmm. um, and installing on a Windows machine, I was really unfamiliar with. So I had to build, um, I had to build binaries for OpenMVS for that program, mm -hmm. and that took so long. It was just Visual Studio took like half a day to update, and then there are all these re dependency requirements. Yeah, it was painful. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, there's tricks to everything. Yeah. I wonder how those guys within. Um, was there any comment made by, for example, when? Prusa, he made that reconstruction of that statue in that video using full map. He didn't mention anything about GPUs and and stuff. Like he didn't raise that as an issue. Did he have a GPU or any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm not sure. I saw that video. Okay. Yeah, it's on the call map page on the OSC wiki. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because because uh, when I saw call map, when I saw, oh no, it's it's called the page is called open source programmetry on the wiki, uh, which I'm pulling up right now. I can uh, share my screen. Yeah, so open source programmetry has this nice video there. There you have a statue, and then you have a 3D print, and it looks like oh no problem. So I guess. Um, and that there were no warnings about some of the difficulties with hardware, which is it's kind of always the case. You know, when when you see something on the internet, like you know, does it really work? Is always the question, and you know, we always run into issues and trying to address that one by one. Okay, well that's good, good progress. Um, maybe you can teach all of us um, if you have any more time before immersion. If you can teach us some something about that during immersion, that would be good. Um, yeah, and I'd also definitely like to try out the pipeline on Linux instead. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, definitely, definitely try that. And and if you haven't seen the, have you seen the open source programmetry page on the wiki? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's that video there. 
Um, but yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see what we can do because during the program, perhaps we can <laughs> we can see how, for example, it might look to 3D scan one of our say, well, the whole 3D printer, for example, or maybe just a part of a 3D printer, um, perhaps as a test exercise. But yeah, let, let's see what what it looks like. The, the idea there being, if we have this on OSE Linux and a tool chain like the software, we know it works, everything works, and we can have people during our design jams incorporate that as part of our normal workflow that we can teach anybody in, a, in rapid time to do. So that's, that's the vision, so that once again, democratizing this process, making it accessible to everybody. All right, so let's continue on the meeting meeting agenda here. So, Eric, any updates there? I see there's a thing. So, tonight I'm going to the local makerspace uh, meetup, um, looking to see if there's a workspace that I can continue learning back from the um, training. OK. Thank you. Uh, shall I move on to John? Let's see, John. Uh, can you speak up or can you? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've had a lot of stuff going on, uh, work and at home, and whatnot. So I've been doing stuff in the evening, but I uh, found a bit more time uh, recently. You know, I kind of changed my sleep schedule around so I get some stuff done in the evening. So. Uh -huh. I was able to do a bit of a build on the uh, extruder on uh, this Sunday. Um, so, yeah, it went pretty well. Um, so definitely uh, what you've done with the uh, build material, you know, getting the exploded part diagram and build materials and required the screws is great. I was kind of, so here's my pictures. Um, now, that was super helpful um, to kind of identify, you know, to start assembly instructions, these are the parts you need. This is uh, where they are going to go, and uh, mm -hmm. that's just super helpful. Um, yeah, so nothing, no real hit hitches on the uh, construction uh, major ones. So, mm -hmm. so I can pull up my photos on it. Um, biggest issue is really the uh, 3D printed rod that goes on the uh, 3D printer filament idler. Uh -huh. um, that ended up uh, being a little bit too large, so I had to file it down so it would fit. That was the largest issue I had. And just, you know, some other minor print issues that, you know, are, you can see pretty plainly, like, uh, I had a little bit of, too much of stickage to the back of the, my heated bed. Uh, yeah, so a yeah, little so bit that. got ripped off. It's kind of cosmetic, but I don't think that's really going to affect it functionally. But, mm -hmm, uh... Mm -hmm. So, right, yeah. Uh, you know, next steps, I got some of the uh, one-inch pipe cut. Um, have a secure fit. I, I was able to locate the correct uh, size screws that will go through the uh, one-inch pipe and screw into the um, universal axis. So, uh, you know, kind of goals moving forward are to get a, you know, the build materials more refined, cleaned up, get those parts together, build the thing, and uh, start running it uh, hopefully soon within the week. Uh, should I find the time and so let's see, let's see this thing run yeah and see what we get um so the, the first thoughts on pvc um with this larger bed size is um, i'm seeing really a pronounced um bending of the tube so yeah, right. I, I let these out and they're, they expose all this heat humidity they really start to bend after a while so yeah. Just storage of the materials for this. It's got to be stored in a flat surface, so it can't bend. Mine has. And there's just several issues with that. That yeah, we'll we'll see how that ends up affecting the prints. But uh, you know, I'm looking forward to get some uh, test prints out. Are there any uh, test prints you're necessarily using for calibration? I know there's plenty of those on uh, online that can be used for like metrology. You make a print. Here's my defined dimensions. Here are my results. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into that side of it and, you know, transfer of any knowledge or experience you have in that regard on how, you know, we can set up a science, you know, a science method of, hey, this is what we expect. Are we getting the quality we require? And just defining what kind of quality we expect out of this. Right. Is uh, sort of next steps because, uh, you know, it was just a matter of getting the materials and I had the materials. I just need, what, a couple hours, really, to get the stuff built. I mean, the extruder took me, um, 
you know, two hours. The rest was just finding documentation, getting stuff organized. Um, you know, then to build a 3D printer should only take me two or three hours when I find the time now that I have all my materials together. Right. Um, the hardest challenge is getting this stuff, you know, in one place. Yeah. And uh, uh, finding the correct screws and measuring stuff. Yeah. That is a big challenge, and I would say, yeah, like, that extruder's got so many different screws. And so, once again, this is not our design. This is borrowed from the Prusa 3D printer, which is the most popular 3D printer in the world. But this yeah. thing is, is very, very complicated. It's got, look at the number of, so if you look at slide number six, look at the number of different screws and components yeah. there. It's crazy. Like Just a huge amount of hardware. Yeah, and the thing that, from our perspective, what we do is we do always the concept of part reduction. So make a little modification and force that screw. Like, for example, cover, M3 and M25, and that yeah. uh, cover piece there. Make them the same. Modify the design and make them the same. Like, make it fit with the intent of minimizing part count is one of your design principles. Well, yeah, and I, could, and I could see that was not considered yeah. in this build. It's like people might say, oh, well, we want to optimize it for um, elegance, well, we want to optimize it for replicability. <laughs> replicability means uh, you keep yeah. it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, it's definitely, there's definitely room, uh, you know, building this, and you've built this as well. There's yeah. definitely plenty of room to uh, mack up this CAD drawing yeah. and uh, iterate on the extruder. So, I mean, that's, that's one of my plans down the road Yeah. Um, for this, definitely. But after we, we let's, let's just, I'm trying to make a personal goal to get some prints this week. So yeah. hopefully I can get there. Yeah, and this um, thing... Yeah, and this so, thing can... Other than that, I just had a... Oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying this thing can can work pretty well and, and get simplified. We can use the Volcano nozzle with this as well. The the larger, much larger nozzles, like 1.2 millimeter, which are huge and they print yeah. so much faster. So that's still uh, forthcoming to be done, but we're doing just one step at a time. Right now, we're just doing the 1.75 millimeter filament. We can use yeah, three exactly. millimeter. I know that Prusa does not do it, and there's controversy where, whether you can make three millimeter work or not as well. But for us, we like bigger because that allows you to scale, to print faster. It's easier to make the filament if you're making three millimeter filament as opposed to 1.75. It's just shorter distance you have to make, and irregularities don't matter as much. So you want to go larger That's when fine. possible. So. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know I've, I've run the Airwolf extensively, the three millimeter on a uh, one point seven to five, or you know smaller nozzles with larger filament. It does kind of wear it down a little bit, and you get some of not sufficient heating. You get some rotation, but yeah, I, let's get some basic prints out of this, guys. Let's get some metrology information and get our data collection done on this, and then we'll let's roll immediately into how can we reduce part count on the extruder, and how can we increase our throughput and output of filament you know one thing at a time yeah. and see if we can get part reduced get yeah, okay it runs fine part reduced next let's add larger nozzles maybe larger throats uh right things like that and see what exactly. we can get out of this extruder that's right um so yeah so on, awesome. um, okay so on page number six in the current document there's a i added the photos folder what i did yeah. is piece by piece I strip that uh, extruder apart from the complete uh, assembly, complete assembled, like right here, step by step. You can trace it. I took out the idler screws. I took out the bearing. I took out the nozzle, uh, step by step, every single step. So that's actually valid for uh, annotation as a build procedure. Like if you study that, you can see that each consecutive picture has just got like one more part exposed until we go to the very, very yeah. end where the last, very, very last picture has every single component exposed and that's what went actually into the visual bill of materials. So, uh, John, maybe I can ask you if you have the time uh, oh, as, a, as a priority for now because that will help during the workshop now in the workshop we'll have a sample extruder and we'll have all these parts. But if we could get a step-by-step -step step sequence like this, that would help for a build instructional. Um, if oh you yeah, can do certainly. That. Okay. I can do that, so, that. I should be able to do that tonight. Yeah. Wrap okay. That will be great. Right. Um, and the idea is uh, this. I like this. These kinds of like if you if you look at the extruder visual bill of materials. 
it's infor super yeah. information dense. Typically, when you have an instructional, they show you step by step, and it's kind of you follow blindly what you're doing. But what we'd like to do is try to, s to show people the comprehensive picture so that when I actually do do this, um, it makes just much more sense. I, I know, for example, if you look at the right. PRISA instructional, the step by step, I mean, I don't really like it. It's, it works, but it's not as information rich. It doesn't give you enough perspective because it's really like designed to be kind of like dumbed down to just, okay, do the step, do the step without ever really having the perspective of what you're doing overall. So if we can get that perspective into our work, that, that would be, that would help people. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Just getting all the parts out in front of someone so you can see this is exactly what I need. You can lay it out and then make it like a Lego build of instructions, like a kid's Lego set, each thing. Cause that's language agnostic and it's really easy to see how it all comes together to a final piece. So it's pretty awesome. Um, Excellent. I'll get that. Yeah. 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 If you could do that, Saturday is when we would need it if you can get it in time. Otherwise, we, we need that. Yeah, yep. we need that. So the start of that would be just start a start a Google presentation, and paste okay. in those pictures consecutively, and we can add, add annotation as far as okay, now take out these two screws, etc., so forth. And you've done it, well, so you actually have a first yeah. hand experience. Definitely, and the, so each each slide, I should yeah, let's put the arrows in each slide and yeah. identify what the part is. Yeah. That'd be awesome. And I and I also what I like to do in these things too is take the calipers as much as I can. And show measurements for things. I think that's helpful too. Yeah. For people. So we can get all that stuff working. Exactly. Awesome. That'll be good. And for the actual build, you know what actually helps a lot? If we simply take a sheet of paper and draw out the outline profiles to scale for all these ones. So when you're actually taking the materials from the inventory area, you're pretty much matching each piece of material to its to its contour on simply a printed sheet of paper. That would be an effective way to to do that, to make sure you've got all the parts. Um, and depends how you do it. Like we'll, we'll have different teams working on different modules of the printer during the build itself. And by the way, guys, uh, 20 builds in a single day. So that's what's happening on SAP. Um, we've got 20 people that are pretty much um, participating in the boot camp the first day, at least. So um, a lot of builds. The what's worked for us before when we did some 3D printer builds is when you, for small comp, when there's many many small parts, it's useful to just print out a sheet of paper, a white sheet of paper, on a printer, and just put the contours of all the parts, labeling the parts, so that when you pick the parts from the part part boxes, you're like matching to a visual cue, so you know you're not just working from a list. You have a visual cue to know that oh, this is actually the correct part because you see its contour on a page. So that, that's something we can do as well. Um, okay. All right. So that's great, great work there, John. So it's, it's kind of cool to see like that, John, you're, you know, you're doing in parallel, you're kind of building the same thing. So we're in remote locations, we're actually collaborating on, on getting the developments on that. So that's good, that, that works. Okay. All righty. All righty, next, uh, do we have Miles? Um, Miles, do we have you here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. So, Miles, you're working on uh, power supply, so some electronics work. So, KiCad is one of the things we're going to cover within the immersion program and the boot camp. Uh, here we have some sample, sample design. So, Miles, take it away. Uh, so, yeah, as you can see, that's uh, with uh, asking for two. Let's see. And uh, you end up with about nine bits at the output. And uh, you got a project file uh, with the capacitor using a dial to uh, limit how much how the limit of voltage because um, the Arduino isn't drawing enough current. The voltage dropped across the, the first capacitor will decrease. And so voltage will increase. So the, the Zener just makes sure that it doesn't go above nine. Uh huh. Zener diodes are are uh, labeled by like at which point they they drop the current. So like you can get one for like nine volts or ten volts or twenty volts. Is that so, or they come in certain values? Yeah. yeah and so the the kind of like an open circuit up until that voltage, and then 
put that voltage as a physics unit and they'll pull current to keep it at or, at or below that voltage. And uh, there's also a, a reference um, seen there as well that uh, I'm not going to put into the first prototype just because they didn't have electronics so I didn't have the part that I needed. I'm just going to test the basic supply first. Okay, so we're working on a basic, basic little power supply. So we're rectifying alternating current. And uh, how, you know, can you explain this for for a sucker in electronics? How do you do this? So you get AC rectified. So we can understand rectification. That you can Google that. Google a rectifier. Um, anyone can do that. An English major can find that out. How to do that? They can understand it. So we got. Um, rectification happening. Tell us about, so okay, fuse in your diagram. So I'm looking at page 11. You got fuse, okay, sure. If you got too much current, you want to blow a fuse so you don't, you don't uh, blow anybody up. You got a switch. What's the deal there, the, the RC, uh, RC deal before the rectifier? What is that? Well, the, the resistor this was there to, to allow the so that's a filter that's okay. like smooth smooth as the signal? What what are we doing there? Oh. oh okay. Oh okay, so that capacitor there gets you down to the required voltage, is that the deal? Yeah, so um you didn't say that capacitor is one. Okay. So are you going there from, you're dropping there from 120 volts to like 6 volts or 5 volts or something, or what are you doing there? Uh, low 10, low 10 volts in there. To 10 volts AC still. Okay. So you're passing 10 volts oh. AC, you're rectifying it. Uh, you got this. Mm -hmm. Can't hear you that well. Oh, sorry, it's um, it's nine uh, volts. You see a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yes, yeah, so the resistor discharges this thing. What if you didn't have that resistor there? You just keep this charged. You didn't have it. It might slowly discharge through the tuner because the tuners have like a very small usage point, and so to the other diodes. Right. So it might just slowly discharge through it. That's a safety feature, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Uh, and what's going on with C2? What does that do? This is, you know. Is, uh, so we're filtering, yeah. Okay. So that's filtering. Yeah. So during the yeah. Yep. So that's okay. Now that's so. Tell us about that there. So is this Hukes, the open source quite universal circuit simulator? Yeah, that was the the graph was created by um, Hukes with Spice, and so it yeah it, it uses ng Spice or it can use any Spice simulator. But I use Wait. ng Spice. To okay, what is Spice? Track. Is that Spice thing open source? The NG Spice is, yes. NG Spice. Um, tell us more about this. I mean, I don't know. I haven't used Qukes before. So you're saying you got NG Spice, which is a software that does what? Tell us more here. Give, give us some perspective. Uh, it does circuit simulation. So so Qukes does the design and the simulation. They have a simulator called Qukesator. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's not very good for transient simulations. Okay. So you can uh, use cubes to create 
uh, it's called the Netherlands, which is kind of like a, a code representation of the circuit. And it passes that to energy spice to do the calculations. So did you take this, was your workflow there to go from, so I'm seeing KiCAD, KiCAD correct, for the upper diagram? Yeah. Okay. So we got um, KiCAD, you're generating a cir circuit, uh, which then you can actually go into a, a, a layout, which you can actually mill on our CNC circuit mill. So you got KiCAD. Are you actually inputting the, the KiCAD uh, design into Spice or NG Spice or Cukes, or no, you're redoing had, it? Had, uh, yeah, I had remade it. There might be a way to do that, but I, I don't know. Uh huh. I wonder if that's. I mean, it should it should be able. I mean, we should, so we don't have to redo things twice, right? Yeah. yeah. Eventually, we should figure, figure that out if that if that's doable. Okay. Excellent. Um, so, I mean, this is pretty high-tech stuff, people, here. So we got an actual simulation. Um, Miles, do you think you can um, create a little video on how you obtained the, that amazing graph of, the, of what you have there? I mean, that's, that's getting to some real analysis there. That's, um, you know... They don't teach you that in kindergarten, but it's something we should we should uh, possibly study up. Can you explain it a little bit? So you've got the, what's the difference between the transient reference versus V V O? What is that? What's the difference there? Uh, the ones on the left are voltage, and so the the left axis is voltage. Where this is So yeah, the, the left the left axis is voltage, and then the right axis is um, is current. So the blue one is uh, is uh, represented by the right axis, and the other two are on the left axis. Uh huh. So you're saying you got like 0.25 of current, and you've got like nine volts or so on the voltage. That's how you read that. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Let me just label that so it's transparent. Yeah. I mean, it's, if you can read that graph, yeah, that that makes sense. That's kind of for the for the English major, the red line is key, the um, voltage graph, and for the botany major, <laughs> we've got the blue one as current. And then the the black one is the reference voltage. Um, and the reference voltage is what? Like you've got like. Four volts reference. What's yeah, the simulation? This would be about uh, four point seven. Uh, you can put in uh, a voltage to the Arduino that it uses as a, as a reference. Mm -hmm. It um, can be more accurate than than its internal reference, but it might not actually be needed if if uh, the internal reference is going to match what you're doing. Okay. Well, it would be really cool if maybe like for for when? I don't know for when, because we got immersion. I don't know when we're going to have our next meeting, people. Uh, we're going to have to think about it. But next week, uh, the the boot camp is here. I can't. I don't think I can really skip unless we do like a really short meeting. Um, we could. Um, we have a lunch time, so maybe we can possibly do that. I mean, the, the program is pretty full f f throughout the whole next five weeks, <laughs> but lunch is available. Uh, would people be okay to meet maybe like at, at lunchtime, like noontime, for the next meeting? Because we got to continue this, people. This is it. This is history in the making. So, is everyone okay with that if um, next week meet at about noontime? Okay. Uh, I would be probably able to be there by like 12 30. 12 30? Okay. Well, since we're relying on you, for, do you think you could uh, you could do that little video of the how you did the simulation for twelve thirty next Tuesday? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's call a meeting for next. So so lunch is twelve to one. Um, let's have a quick, like a pretty quick, powerful check-in meeting next week uh, on all the progress at twelve thirty.
I'll send an email out to everybody on that, but that's good. So what we're seeing here on this Arduino power supply page is, is a crash course in, uh, in circuits, but what we're seeing is Qx, the open source circuit simulator, meaning you draw the circuit, and if there's time dependent stuff like alternating current or any kind of a switching power supply, like for an induction furnace, the holy grail to me is the induction furnace, people. Uh, and this is, it's going to be a derivative of this, what we got here. It's going to be, you know, this plus other elements. But if you've got an induction furnace, for example, you definitely want to simulate it in a circuit, circuit simulator. And then you can mill parts with our CNC circuit mill. You can design the CAD for milling and within KeyCAD. So there's a whole open tool chain that we're developing and spreading to the public. Uh, but this is cool. This is really cool. I learned something here. Um, let's see what more we can do. So, Miles, let's do that next week at uh, 1230. That'll be awesome. Well, thank you for this excellent uh, little tutorial here. So that's good. Um, I'll just make a note here. This this is Qux. It's called Q Q U C S, which is quite universal circuit simulator. This is what yes. this result comes from. These are all accessible tools. If we know how to do them, to use them, then it's pretty powerful to actually um, be productive. So, so the, the simulation was done with Qx-S, which is uh, a modification that someone made to uh, let it use Spice. Uh huh. For Spice integration. Yeah. And you said Spice is proprietary, but NG Spice is open source. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Uh, next person. Uh, looks like Abe's got a lot of cool stuff there on the power cube there. Abe, you want to continue on that? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember where I last updated. Uh, I did last time, so right. Um, I did update the the CAD before I, I, I kind of merged everything from uh, the large power cube and frame and all that. I just went to the smaller cube frame, and uh, that I think those are pretty well up to date now. And um, I've been reviewing uh, more different CAD design stuff because uh, with Git and everything, I've been looking at that. So I'm trying to figure out how to do my CAD files better. Is that that a pretty good um, way of doing that? But I'm thinking it broken down more with more files of smaller parts and, and not uh, uh, you just do more uh, assembly and sub-assembly, but uh, that w w should work better with Git and things like that because uh, I hadn't even really been using the uh, Git repository features. I've just been uploading the files in a simple manner, so I'm figuring some of that out. But um, <clears throat> gun, uh, call map. I don't have a GPU uh, either because it takes an NVIDIA GPU that's pretty good. And I don't have one of those. I know in most most laptops because they don't have that NVIDIA. Uh, it's an older CUDA framework for acceleration. Uh, a lot of laptops and other computers, if you don't have a fairly decent, uh, discrete graphics card in a desktop, then it's probably not going to do work well. Um, so I just use the CPU, and mostly because it takes so long in some cases, I just started doing tests, trying to figure out how the photos, uh, you know, different effects of the photographs and quality of the, the backgrounds and so on, uh, would affect uh, the speed and, and what works for, for getting more points. I was trying to get more points in the cloud, even on the sparse. And um, I saw some, one tutorial on but it was uh, usually they demo taking pictures of rocks. And from what I can tell, uh, that's because you, you need a lot of texture kind of on your part, smooth parts. I don't know how well they work unless you take really high resolution photos, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was using a wooden part for that most, but I, I tried different things like putting masking tape on it because I you know, did that with the paddle in that example. Um, a lot of times I took photos and when I started doing the masking, like the, the photographs uh, as demonstrated in that one tutorial, 
the rock, they said that you have to leave a certain amount of stuff around uh, the object, but you can erase a lot of the background, and that eliminates hopefully some of those wasted. I, that it's wasted uh, compute on all the, the background points because you don't even want those points in your cloud. You just want points on the object. Although I was a little confused about whether some some points around it might help it compute uh, or triangulate because it, it is trying to triangulate like the shape of the object from specific texture points. Uh, at one point I tried this uh, the grid background and, and what I got from that was just a bunch of points that look like a grid. So I, I stopped doing that. Um, I think what worked best maybe, especially for like this wooden object that I tried to uh, test with, is getting closer shots, not just higher resolution, but closer shots that overlap more. And getting some of the grain up closer will help you uh, get, I think, a little better, uh, more points on the on the object. Um, so I, I may test more with that, but mostly I'm just trying to figure out what works fastest, um, you uh -huh. know, to maybe speed up some of the, the processing on that. Um, I don't have a GPU because I know that there was a lot of waste points. And I did I did load some of my uh, stuff into, like, MeshLab and, and figure some of that out. But I, I always tended to have very few points, even when I, I did photographs outside on a cloudy day. Uh, it was a lot better, but it it still um, was kind of kind of lacking. So I think resolution matters a little more than I thought, and uh, just getting closer shots and making sure that they overlap. Uh, for small objects, you probably would need to focus up real close and try to get grain, you know, on the on the object. But at first, I didn't think that resolution mattered that much. I'm not sure it does, but it just needs to be able to find features to match. Um, and I, I'm still not sure I understand exactly how it processes all that out, even though I read through the cold information on a bunch of that. It does say that there are issues with cameras. I noticed that there was some other software listed on the photogrammetry page there that uh, uh, works differently, and it more specifically <clears throat> has a database with different types of cameras because it wants to figure out information about the color, space, and I think the... Uh, the, the lens and focal points and so on. Um, but I, oh, the other thing that I did was I was doing pretty much all uh, video instead of um, just taking individual images. I thought it'd be quicker to do video. And I think the thing that worked best was doing like a smooth motion on my phone. It was 60 frames a second, which seemed odd, but it it, it, it kept it from being too blurry. A higher frame rate helped it. And then a short video by walking around the object. And then in, in Caden Live, I just extract uh, frames. Caden Live has a, has a function. You just speed, speed the video up to like a thousand percent, and then you just tell it to extract the frames. And it does that like in several seconds. And then you've got like 50 to 100 photos or whatever you set it to based on speed. And then it mm -hmm. can process those photos like that. So that, that seemed to work pretty well for extracting photos. Mm -hmm. from video. Yeah. Okay. That sounds pretty good. So, keep going. Uh, yeah, team up with Sarah and then Alex. Have we heard anything from Alex at all regarding this? I think he might be on vacation. He's one of the immersion people. I haven't heard anything from him recently. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that sounds good. So, I, I need to get going here on my side here uh, to re register the van so we can people <laughs> pick people up on on Friday evening. Uh, but yeah, this is good. Uh, some pretty powerful updates this week. We're continuing. Um, there's going to be a lot of activity happening, lots of hubbub and 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 progress happening out of the boot camp itself and out of the immersion because part of that will be doing some of the builds and, and continuing development and learning and updates but yeah let's do um let's do the 12 30 next week and i think we we'll probably want to do that uh for the next few weeks during the immersion program and that that's looking really good it's game day i'm doing inventorying and really busy with all the details uh leading up to that but um yeah great stuff uh so thanks everybody and we'll see you next 
next week. Any quick questions before I run out here? Uh, any questions or concerns? Okay, so that's good. Uh, and just a note, we are trying to get the the agenda up like as soon as we're done today because progress happens throughout the week it's nice to as soon as you have something to actually put it into the development meeting agenda if you have a good result so that you don't have to scuttle for that on tuesday like before a meeting feel free to do that so uh asking jan who keeps these meeting agendas to kindly post them as soon as possible after the tuesday meeting so that we have the next one already prepared so whenever we have any updates we have a venue we have a placeholder where we can put that in instead of uh, trying to go, go back to our former results on Tuesday. So that's about it. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, game day is Friday. We'll continue meeting next week. And see you soon. Thank you.